dear Mr. Kramenia, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it's a pleasure for me to welcome you here at the European Experience in the heart of the European Quarter in Luxembourg, the new visitor center that the European Commission and the European Parliament have opened in May for you uh, and for all other citizens who want to get a closer and better idea of what Europe does, how it works. And the subject uh, that we are talking about tonight is certainly a part of what Europe does, maybe not necessarily what the European Union is doing, uh, but it's nevertheless uh, something that brings us all together and I'm happy to see so many of you here in this room. When we talk about financial responses to crisis, when we talk about financial stability, uh, we are entering a territory where, as we are at the Parliament seat here in Luxembourg, I also need to underline uh, that uh, parliamentary oversight, uh, that democratic scrutiny is a bit more limited than on other actions that the European Union as such does. But I'm happy uh, that Mr. Kramenia, who is here tonight, um, has also entered not only into exchange with the European Parliament, but in 2023, the ESM and the Parliament signed a memorandum of cooperation, which established a framework for better uh, cooperation between those two institutions and a memorandum that uh, will certainly help to improve the inter-institutional dialogue between ESM and Parliament and enhance also um, aspects like transparency and accountability. I do not want to enter too much into details because I know that uh, we have other speakers who will welcome you and who are even better prepared than I am. But uh, let me uh, allow you to uh, invite you already at the end of this conference uh, to join us for a drink and for a small reception and maybe also discover the interactive exhibition space uh, that is uh, located right uh, in. Um, this room and the area where we will have the reception. Uh, this visitor center is now open Monday to uh, Saturday from 8, correct me, from 10 to 6 in the evening. And uh, I can only invite you, if you have guests coming over here in summertime, bring them along and show them what Europe does, not only to help uh, um, dealing with financial uh, crisis, but in uh, all in all also in direct service for the citizens of this European Union. This is why we are here um, and uh, this is why we are also happy to host this conference tonight. And with that, I have the pleasure to give the floor to the Rector of the University of Luxembourg, to Mr. Kreisel. Thank you very much. I find it kind of difficult to, to, to continue after a person who has just been introducing that we will have drinks. Uh, so we will all stand in between the drinks and you. So um, as an introduction, thank you very much. Mr. Gramenia, um, distinguished guests and uh, excellencies, dear partners of the Robert Treffen Lectures, um, ladies and gentlemen, einen schönen guten Abend in allen. C'est un plaisir de vous recevoir ce soir. Um, I, I heard that Italian seems to be the lingua franca this evening, so unfortunately I cannot do this, so I will do my, my little Luxembourgish, so uh, good Abend. So as the rector of the University of Luxembourg, it's really a, a pleasure to welcome you here, and it's a real privilege, to the Bridge Forum Dialogue and yet to another Robert Triffin lecture. I would like to underline first um, that we have been coming together and that this lecture is prepared in cooperation between different organizations, the European Stability Mechanism, the European Parliament Liaison Officer Office in Luxembourg, the Foundation Robert Triffin International and the University of Luxembourg. So the, the good news is right from the beginning on we don't have five events as we often have here in, in, in Luxembourg in the evening, but we're all here together for uh, listening to Mr. Gramenio and also for having drinks, um, drinks together. And I'm really very grateful for this uh, partnership because it brings a lot of experts together and it usually comes out having a larger uh, discussion. So um, this year, as uh, you all would know, marks the 80th uh, anniversary of the Bretton Woods uh, Conference, which ultimately has kick-started the International Monetary uh, Fund. It has been, it's clear, a very visionary uh, idea. It gave birth uh, to the euro 25 years ago already, which started in 2019. 20, uh, so it will be really, uh, really interesting to reflect on, 
our response, on the financial responses to the challenges we have ahead of us. And uh, I believe we all agree that the challenges we have ahead of us are, are quite important. Um, some would claim every generation has had uh, dramatic and important challenges ahead of us, but I think we are not too bad in a comparison of challenges. Um, we very certainly have an extraordinary disruptive change in technology. And I think it is fair to say that this has not happened for a quite long time. It is also clear that the uh, climate events we're having today are, are dramatic, and there cannot be any doubt, any doubt that there is scientific evidence for, uh, for climate uh, change. Our economies are very much under pressure for a number of years by now, and the geopolitical tensions um, are difficult, and I really don't know where this uh, will be going. So um, it is interesting, and, and it will be also interesting for me to hear um, what are the financial responses to this. And uh, I believe it is interesting to discuss perhaps also later on that not only we be con uh, need considerable funds, but we also to need, to, need to combine public and private funds. I'm very much uh, convinced that we need both of them. The public funds will not be uh, enough. I find this a quite interesting question to ask us on what topic we will have what mix, which topics will be more dominated by public funds, which will be more dominated by private funds, and which go more into public-private uh, 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 partnerships. So um, with this, I would like to share with you three, uh, three thoughts um, which accompany me for uh, a couple of years, in particular since I'm uh, in management positions. And uh, please bear with me, these are, are general comments. I'm just applying them uh, to, this, uh, to the topic of tonight. The first one is perhaps one of the first lessons I've learned as a manager, is that nothing is more structuring than money. Money is very structuring. Or as some colleagues of mine would say, the cats always go to the milk pot. And if the milk pot is money, then it is very much structuring. Um, but it is much more than this. Um, financing is uh, uh, sending out signals, is structuring things. And I believe that we need elements which provide clarity, which provide structure, and which provide uh, signals. And I believe this is particularly true for the green and digital economy. Because here and there, people might also feel that this is a bit too much to speak about green and digital, and you can very easily uh, get lost in complexity when you speak also about sustainability, because there are so many different dimensions, There's the social dimension, the economic dimension, the ecologic uh, dimension. So we must be sure of not being lost in complexity, so we need clarity on this. And it is clear that our, our children, our students at the university and the society at large, will judge us later on on the efforts and the clarity we have been providing in front of these uh, uh, challenges. So at the university, we, we are also trying to send out signals. We have just been creating uh, a, a new interdisciplinary center in European law. I believe it is really important um, in a just society to reflect on law, how law will shape democracy today and uh, tomorrow, and we have just been creating also a new interdisciplinary center in environmental systems, we, because we believe we need to send out a, a signal in, in, in that context. So um, to finish that point, I believe that financing models, finance, financial instruments, they can provide the needed clarity, and they can be very strong instruments for providing clarity and providing the necessary signals uh, uh, with in front of these um, challenges. The, the, the second point um, which is accompanying me in particular as, as, as a rector is that planning the future is, is not something straightforward at all. We've got all tendencies, I don't know in, in which institutions you all are, we're, we're doing plans for the next 20 to 30 years, but, but we, in our heart we know uh, no one can predict really these 20 to 30 years. And one person has been, has been phrasing this very well, um, is a Swiss author, Friedrich Dürrematt, and he has said, the more humans proceed by plan, the more effectively they may be hit by accident. Um, so, yeah, that's part of the question. So let us still reflect a little bit on, 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 on planning, because I have the feeling that this um, sentence about is planning possible and how often you're hit by this is, has been really invented for artificial intelligence. If you reflect on different topics uh, and different challenges, not artificial intelligence, but climate change or... Um, medicine or democracy, for some of them you can reflect in what is happening in 10 years' time. 
for some of them, not all of them. And if you identify your vision where you want to go and where you want to be in 10 years' time, then you can do the retro engineering and you can develop a strategy where to go. But who of us, who of us knows where we will stand with artificial intelligence in 10 years' time? We know it's a disruption, we know there will be change, but we've got absolutely no idea, absolutely no idea how it will look like in 10 years', uh, 10 years time. So the CEO of N NVIDIA, uh, that's the manufacturer of most of the um, memories and, 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 and microelectronics for, for calculating um, AI, etc., he said, we are in the iPhone moment of AI, that's right. But, uh, okay, we, we know the moment, but we don't know where to go. And by the way, at the moment, the iPhone moment, we had no clue where we were to go. We were just seeing that some of them, including Nokia, had, had, had problems. So generative AI, large language models, will transform entire industries. It will, uh, of course, modify entire industries, also like the financial industries, is perhaps one of the most struck industries, by the way. And we will be struck. Huh? We, we are mostly, I guess, white colors in this room. And uh, unfortunately, this is the first revolution which will touch us very much, the white colors, because it's difficult to replace a number of manual works. Uh, but we might um, be um, touched. But by the way, there is a German uh, um, um, Futuromat, and you can pin, put in your job, and then you can see to what percentage you can be replaced. <clears throat> I've done this. So a rector, I can tell you, can be pretty much replaced by artificial intelligence. It's not a really enlightening thing to do, so I do it for the fun, but not for, for joining you, uh, you up. So the question is really, can we really plan for in 15 years? And I believe that's very uh, difficult. So we must be prepared to navigate in uncertainty, um, in, in real uncertainty. It requires agility. It requires um, financial agility, not setting up everything for the next 15 years. And it requires understanding, and hence, as a rector of the university, forgive me, it requires research. It requires understanding the very fundamental um, mechanisms. And it will require, and this is my third point, um, thousands of top trained talent. One of the most important financial investments, I believe, is investing in talents. At least in the university, and I believe also in your institutions, people make the difference, individuals make the difference, the ideas of individuals make, the, uh, make all the, uh, the difference. Talents and partnerships, people can't work alone, they are very strong resources. And whatever the problem is today in security, in stability, in the society, we need to collaborate. And I say it all the time now in our university, no research alone, no faculty, no university, no country, and no industry alone can really drive uh, the changes. We have to act as an ecosystem. And um, a word I like much more than ecosystem is social network, because I find this is the most Luxembourgish uh, work I could think of. You know, if you think about a social network, which country would be more a social network than, uh, than, than, uh, than Luxembourg? Um, so higher education really has to play a, a, a very important uh, role in this. And I can just say, as a research university, our university, the University of Luxembourg, takes this very, very serious, uh, not only attracting talents, but retaining talent. An interesting number is, out of our graduates at the University of Luxembourg, 60%, 60% stay in Luxembourg. And I'm often asked, why do they, why do they stay in Luxembourg? Not necessarily because of the university, they stay in Luxembourg because of Luxembourg. Because, because I met a wife, is your proposition? Yeah, perhaps an Italian wife, I don't know. Okay, so um, I, 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 will st I will stop here. Um, so, um, but it's really my three uh, main points. There is uh, nothing more structuring than, uh, than money. Um, so you for the tool in your hands, Mr. Gramenia. Um, it is difficult to plan, especially in a society with artificial intelligence, and we will not do anything, anything with the correct amount of talents. Let me give, you know, I'm a physicist, I'm a num I'm, I, I love number crunch, and give you one number, it has nothing to do with finance, but shows you this challenge. In Germany, my home country, in the last 10 years, the number of students in engineering has dropped by 50%. Five, zero percent. In Germany, the country of engineers. So uh, just as a consequence for Luxembourg, Imagine where the engineers, if they are not produced in Luxembourg, where, do, where will they come from? My gut feeling is they will not come from Germany. We have to be prepared for this. When it comes to talents, we have to think of ourselves 
and the university is making you here, um, as consultants would say, a value proposition. So um, with this, I would like to stop. I would like to, to thank you, really, the Bridge Forum Dialogue and all our partners, uh, really, for this very excellent initiative of, of making this room full, which is really great. There is a lot of interest around this. Um, I would like to thank specifically uh, for, to, uh, to Pierre Gramegna for being here. I know that you're a great friend uh, of our university. When I've been vice rector of research, I've seen you very often. The very first question you've asked me tonight, how is the university doing? We can count on you as a friend. And I would also finish by thanking Elena Danishku for setting up uh, the event. And I believe I leave you in very good hands, in the hands of Pierre Gramegna. Thank you very much. So, dear Mr. Pierre Gramenia, Managing Director of the um, European Stability Mechanism, Vice President of the Bridge Forum Dialogue, and uh, keynote speaker of the Robert Triffin Lecture Edition 2024, dear Professor Jens Kreisel, Rector of the University of Luxembourg, dear Professor Bernard Snoa, pre President of the Robert Triffin International, distinguished guests, excellencies, dear partners, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of your direct at the University of Luxembourg, a public history co-financed by EU competitive uh, funding and its partner that the Rector mentioned, um, I uh, would like to express my gratitude to the Bridge Forum Dialogue and the Liaison Office uh, in uh, uh, Luxembourg of the European Parliament, which has given us the opportunity to meet this evening around a topic of highest interest, the evolution of Europe's financial response to challenges, and an eminent invited speaker, Pierre Gramenia. But before getting to the heart of the matter, allow me to mention that these constellations of partners, led by the University of Luxembourg and Robert Triffin International, has long been reflecting together on the history of an Europe built to through currency, especially on economic and monetary union, as it emerged from the visionary spirit, innovative ideas, and intellectual dialogue between Pierre Werner and Robert Triffin, who since the early 1960s have forged the framework of economic and monetary union in Europe, based on irreversibility and perfect symmetry between the economic and monetary aspects, with political union and democratic strengths as the ultimate objective and the social dimension as an intrinsic component of economic and monetary union. Since 2011, Mr. Gramenia has always honored this joint effort of the University and Robert Triffin International in our debates, in um, getting his expertise, his original insights, and his participation in his various capacities in, and functions. Even though he is perfectly well known in Luxembourg and worldwide. Allow me please to mention that Mr. Gramenia is since December 2022 the Managing Director of the European Stability Mechanism and the CEO of the European Financial Stability Facility. He was Minister of Finance of Luxembourg and member of the ESM Board of Governors from 2013 to 2022. During his mandate, Mr. Gramenia rebalanced the national budget and ensured that Luxembourg fully compiled with the EU Stability and Growth Pact. During his term, the country was rated AAA by all rating agencies. In 2017, Mr. Gramenia set up the Luxembourg House of Financial Technology to promote fintech and enhance digitalization of the financial center in which the University of Luxembourg is also a trendsetter. As Minister of Finance, Mr. Gramenia served as governor to the International Monetary Fund and several multilateral development banks. Pierre Gramenia held previously a diplomatic career spanning from 1983 to August 2003, holding various posts, including Ambassador of Luxembourg in Japan, also accredited in South Korea, 
from 1996 to 2002, Consul General of Luxembourg in San Francisco from 1993 to 1996, Consular at the Embassy of Luxembourg in Paris, 1988-1992, and Secretary for Secretary at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Luxembourg from 1983-1988. Um, the program this evening includes the keynote speaker of Mr. Gramenia, followed by a key uh, Q&A session moderated by Professor Fabio Mazzini from the University Roma Tre and General Secretary of Robert Triffin International, and at the end, the conclusion uh, pronounced by Professor Bernard Noir, President of Robert Triffin International. Let me add, please, uh, that this event is a hybrid one. It is a live broadcasted by the Media Center of the University with the help of the European Parliament. And uh, the event is also recorded. It will be subsequently published on the university website in the Library of Audiovisual Documents on. Europe. Now I have the pleasure to invite to take the floor Mr. Pierre Gramenia for his keynote entitled The Evolution of Europe Financial Response to Challenges. What next? Thank you. So, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for. for joining us for this uh, uh, event. Uh, ple pleasure to see a, a few or a lot uh, familiar faces uh, and uh, some unknown ones. So uh, let me start by thanking uh, the organizers, so uh, the Bridge Forum, um, but also then our host here, the European Parliament. Thank you, Christoph. Uh, also for, for the, the logistical support uh, and also thank you for organizing the Robert Schumann Day here uh, on the 9th of May. It was a great venue. I'd like to, to thank, obviously, Jens for your kind words, but also for the interesting things you said about university. I'm going to say a few things about that. Uh, I'd like to thank the Robert uh, Triffin um, International Foundation and uh, uh, Elena Danescu for your kind introduction, uh, which was uh, far too... Uh, um, illogical and uh, far too long. And I say to myself, uh, the longer your CV, the older you are. <laughs> now, um, before starting uh, to comment, the title might be misleading because I'm going to address the issue of the financial response from the angle of the ESM. So I'm not going to treat the topic in general. I might allude to two things uh, in the course of the speech, but obviously as we are a crisis management institution, you can call us a lender of last resort or you can call us an institution that is there to respond to crisis, I'm focusing more on that angle and I don't have uh, the intention tonight to cover all possible venues in terms of financing for Europe that uh, could be chosen. Um, just to uh, limit the scope uh, of my speech, because otherwise you might think, but we will have time in questions and answers to address that. Are there other uh, aspects of uh, financial European initiatives that should be considered? That being said, nothing is more structuring than money. Yes. That's what my father always told me. He was a banker, a local banker in a, in a retail bank here in Luxembourg. And he always thought that um, I was too much of a poet and that one day I should get serious in life. Uh, and uh, one topic where we always diverge, sorry for this personal note, but you'll see it is connected with what uh, we discuss here today, he never believed that Europe would have a common currency. And at my very young age, at 15, 16, so it's probably because I had heard about the Werner report, I was always talking about that, the EQ and all the Euro name was not yet around. And my father would use that point to say, you're still a dreamer. The only thing that counts is the dollar. 
And so that I have been appointed finance minister was already, pro for, my father passed away a long time ago. From up there, he was probably very doubtful that Luxembourg would have done a decent choice because he thought that I was not mathematical enough. But then even more so to become then the managing director of the ESM is quite a paradox for him. So I hope that when I meet him upstairs, he, he, he will not uh, be too disappointed. You're right, money is structuring a lot of things. And Friedrich Sturenmatt's comment on planning is very right. But it is not, if you do not plan, that you have no accidents. It's maybe even worse. If you do not plan, you still have accidents. So it's always better to have a plan. And last but not least, on attracting talent partnership, uh, I think the university is a case in point. But it's another illustration of what Luxembourg is. A European laboratory, a country where half the people are foreigners, a, a country that is open, and this diversity, what has it brought to Luxembourg? Well, a lot of wealth, a lot of prosperity, and we are lucky enough, we are also a very safe country. So uh, the recipe of Luxembourg can probably not be easily replicated in all countries, but definitely in a period of fragmentation of nationalisms. It's very nice to live in a country like this one because we can lead by example that uh, we are stronger together. So, um, so your introduction gave me a lot of uh, inspiration. Uh, I would like now to also say that uh, what you do here as European Parliament in telling people about the challenges of Europe and what Europe does for citizens and for companies is crucial. And uh, sometimes it is difficult to understand how Europe works. And it is uh, not always easy to explain. And very often simplistic arguments are used to deceive people. And sometimes these simplistic or wrong arguments win the day. So we need a lot of pedagogy. And uh, because pedagogy brings clarity and that brings trust. And uh, what we're lacking uh, a lot in, in Europe right now is not only money, but trust. So we need to tell the story uh, of Europe to tell what we do and how we do it. And together, we go farther, we go better, we go safer, and we will be more prosperous and also more safe. Now, what is, there's many ways in to, to measure how uh, our citizens and how our companies see Europe. Uh, for what it's worth, I took the spring barometer of uh, uh, this uh, spring 2024, and in terms of where our economy uh, is uh, heading, uh, the result is the best uh, since 2019. So prior to the pandemic, 47% of respondents say that they think that our economy is good. That's the highest level since five years. But 41 consider that the economy is faring badly. Nevertheless, you can look at the growth that we have for, for this year and next year as rather promising. We will have growth of 1% according to the EU Commission this year and around 1.5% next year. But even if this is a good result in the aftermath of the pandemic on the one side and in the aftermath of the energy crisis, inflation provoked by the aggressive war of Russia in Ukraine, uh, yes, we had a soft landing, but our growth is only one-third of the growth of the United States. And this trend has been continuing for quite some time. So we definitely have a challenge uh, of, uh, of growth which we need to address. So the overall positive sentiment I have on Europe is maybe not necessarily directly connected to the fact that we have 1% of growth or 1.5%, but more to the fact that in the face of the recent crisis, Europe has shown quite a lot of resilience and uh, has shown a capacity to bounce back. And this capacity to bounce back or find common answers is probably what characterizes Europe. 
And uh, therefore, I will spend a little bit of time looking back. So I, I would call this the lessons of history. Bear with me, some of you in the room know these things, but I, maybe not all of you. But I, because I, I think we can find uh, food for thought in, in the past. But then uh, in the lessons of history, I'm going to go a little bit to the institution of the EU, but also look at uh, the last 15 years more precisely. Then in part two, I'm going to focus on the challenges of today and in the part three on possible solutions and the potential role of the European Stability Mechanism, the ESM, which, by the way, I take this opportunity to say it, has its headquarters here on Kirchberg, not far from here. Because I have so many friends who, are, when they see me sometimes in, in Esch or in Luxembourg, they say, how is it in Brussels? <laughs> so we, we have now larger signs on our building, which is behind Auchan, if you're looking for us. But I hope you don't need us because if you were looking for us, it means that you have a deep crisis, which I do not wish any of you. So, lessons from history. So, we are, the European construction uh, uh, was uh, born uh, and, and rose uh, from the ashes of World War II. So, it, it is definitely a peace project. I'll come back uh, to that. And what did we do together with our American partners? The Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan uh, um, foresaw $13 billion for the reconstruction of Europe, supporting 16 countries, including Luxembourg. If you actualize this number or calculate it up to today, how much $13 billion would be today, it would be $170 billion. At the time, it corresponded to 10.5 percent of the GDP of Europe, an enormous amount. And this generated the post-war boom that uh, is called in French les trente glorieuses, uh, with growth rates that were quite spectacular until the middle of the 70s. Then in the middle of the 70s, we had the different oil shocks and a period of stagflation. Now, some uh, specialists, economists say that eventually today we might enter in a period of stagflation, which means, in fact, uh, low growth, stagnation, and high inflation. Uh, I'm not sure this is the case today because the uh, European Central Bank has reacted quite quickly in 2022 uh, when inflation was rising fast. And when you look at the rate today, uh, compared to what we have in the 70s. There's no comparison. There were two-digit numbers for inflation in the past. So then the, the 80s was an interesting decade because that's the one where we sowed the seeds for the creation of the EU single market, which is one of our greatest achievements. Uh, that was uh, then uh, agreed in the European Single Act of 1987. The single act was signed in Luxembourg. And this materialized uh, six years later in 1993 uh, with the completion of the European single market, which is the great achievement of Jacques Delors and his commission. And uh, this project uh, uh, has been quite successful uh, during the, the 90s and 2000s and uh, um, helped Europe grow. Uh, also in that period. Let's not forget that in 1992, we had a risk of collapse of the European monetary system and uh, that we had uh, a tech bubble in 2000. And in those 90s, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, we also set up the euro in, uh, in the wake of the Maastricht Treaty, which was signed in 1993. In 1999, 11 countries joined the euro, and in the meantime, uh, many countries uh, adhered both to the EU and to the euro area, with one single exception, is obviously the United Kingdom, which left the EU back in 2016. Today, we have 20 countries that have adopted the euro, and soon, let's knock on wood, soon, uh, Bulgaria is going to join, so we will have 21 countries out of 27 that will use 
the euro. And these are the countries, the ones that have the euro, that are the members of the ESM, because the ESM is there to safeguard the euro area. For, for those who, who follow this since a long time, I would say that the creation of the euro, the setting up uh, of uh, the, the ESM in, uh, and, and lots of other measures that were taken because we have a common currency uh, is the deepest element of integration that we have in Europe. Some even say that it's because we have the euro, and that was, in fact, I think the theory that was already defended by Pierre Werner and, and others uh, in the aftermath. It's thanks to the euro, the European construction might become irreversible. I knock on wood and I hope it's true, but even if it's not true, it's good to believe it. Let's come to more recent history, and especially in the, to the last 15 years, where we had three major crises. The, what was called the uh, sovereign debt crisis back in 2009, which uh, also nearly became a euro crisis, uh, and the pandemic, and obviously uh, the war in Ukraine. Three major shocks, and I must say, looking back, to these three shocks that uh, Europe managed uh, to navigate those three crises quite well. As Jean Monnet used to say, Europe has been forging crises and will be the sum of solutions found. I think these three examples illustrate it very well and uh, have shown that uh, we have made significant strides in bolstering our resilience. The integrity of the euro uh, area was preserved, uh, the banking sector was strengthened, and the banks are the bloodline of our economies, much more so than, for example, in the United States. Um, I would say that we have shown an unprecedented level of solidarity, particularly in the aftermath of the pandemic, uh, as we launched the next generation EU program uh, which was created to help countries recover after the lockdowns of our economies but uh, also help uh, countries uh, rebound after these lockdowns. So this EU, NGEU program uh, is roughly worth 750 billion euro and uh, is still ongoing uh, for the next two years. And its magnitude is similar to uh, the magnitude of the Marshall Plan I mentioned in the beginning and represents 10% of the EU's GDP. So we are probably not aware uh, that what we have decided there is really a major step into solidarity, sticking together and, and not focusing on nationalis nationalism. In this uh, NGU program, half of it nearly is grants, the other half is uh, subsidies. And third point, uh, the uh, distribution of these grants and subsidies is generously tilted toward the more vulnerable countries. If you had asked me uh, in 2019, prior to the pandemic, if Europe were to be as generous and would have such an act of solidarity, I would not have bet on it. So it's a good surprise in the spirit of Jean Monnet's comment. And uh, so if I would not have betted, it means a lot because I am a natural optimist. And those who know me uh, know that this is the case. So in this crisis, Back uh, the pandemic in 2020, in the night of the 9th of April 2020, uh, on top of the NGEU program I just mentioned, the European Commission, the European Investment Bank, and the ESM uh, decided support measures to support people and uh, businesses. Uh, in that context, the ESM proposed something that was called the Pandemic Crisis Support Mechanism, an instrument that uh, was there to help finance uh, health measures in the context of the pandemic. 
So uh, I mention this because I'll come back to this uh, later. Since uh, the Russia war in Ukraine, you, Europe, on top of the pandemic, which we have survived, uh, was faced with another tragedy, uh, foremost a human one, but obviously uh, with also economic challenges and the energy crisis uh, which came after that. And also here, Europe acted steadfast with the Repower EU program, which uh, makes Europe less dependent uh, on um, Russian gas and oil. If you look at the numbers there, we used to uh, be dependent on Russian uh, gas to the extent of 45%, and it's now a third of that, only 15%. Um, we also managed to mobilize uh, enormous amounts of money to uh, support Ukraine, and uh, this was done partly in European budgets, and uh, in total, uh, and uh, we have mobilized 145 billion euro in financial, military, humanitarian, and refugee assistance at European level to a large uh, extent. Uh, most recently, European leaders have uh, also pledged 50 billion for a new Ukraine facility. What I want to underline here is that these numbers are quite huge, and this war in Ukraine was not foreseen. So this is also a European response, a collective response to this geopolitical uh, turmoil and uh, to this unacceptable war. So together with the United States, we have uh, delivered very quickly on the support of Ukraine and this issue uh, uh, of the war in Ukraine is unfortunately also staying with us now for more than two years. So let me now, having looked a little bit back, come to part number two, which is the challenges of today. Europe is at a new crossroads. Uh, ahead of uh, the European uh, Parliament elections, which took place uh, only last month, um, Eurobarometer survey showed that 37% of EU citizens put defense and security as first priorities in reinforcing the EU position globally. Uh, another survey shows that 77% of Europeans are in favor of a common defense and security policy among EU countries. So a very high level of commitment towards this topic. Um, According to the same survey, survey, the war in Ukraine is considered by 35% of Europeans as the most important issue currently facing the EU. This is seven points more than autumn last year. So I think there is now a, a recognition that these geopolitical issues are becoming foremost, taking center stage for, for most of us. We have unfortunately rediscovered the horrors of war and I think we cannot take peace for granted as we have known it. So, as I mentioned in the beginning, Europe is also and maybe mainly a peace project and please keep that in your mind when we discuss the whole issue about financing, uh, uh, giving a financial answers to the challenges of today. Now, as ESM, we are there to help in situations of weakness and crisis of different countries, but we're also there to try to prevent those crises by analyzing which are the largest risks, the largest challenges. And we have identified three megatrends, which I'm going to dwell on a little bit. Let me mention them. First is obviously the geoeconomic fragmentation. Second, climate change, and the third one, aging population. Geoeconomic fragmentation. Total, total trade worldwide is not growing as quickly as it used to, not only in the time of the pandemic where it, it was even receding, but its growth is far less than it used to be. We live in a per period where globalization is being challenged and fragmentation 
is uh, um, prominent. But this is hitting Europe more than any other parts of the world. Total trade with the rest of the world amounts for Europe at 60% of our GDP. And in this number, we exclude our trade amongst ourselves. So this is our trade as EU with the rest of the world represents 60% of our GDP. For China, this number is 38%. And for the United States, only 27%. So when trade is falling behind, the continent that is most hit by definition is Europe. This has also uh, effects on finance. In stable times, Europe attracts a lot of investors. Some euro area assets tend to have a safe haven characteristics. But when war is looming at, our, at the doorstep of the European Union, obviously, we are becoming less attractive. And in a geopolitically tense environment, there's a higher risk also of capital outflows. So I think we must not neglect that. This is probably not on the radar of most of you, but peace is very favorable to attract capital. War is not. Um, at a time also where the European Central Bank is reducing its asset purchases, this leads to a stronger bond supply in financial markets. And the, this supply has uh, been taken up a lot by foreign investors. This change in investor base can lead to an increased sensitivity to political uncertainty and market volatility. So obviously, this is the kinds of analysis that we do in the ESM, and I would like to take this opportunity to greet a few of my management board members who are here today and uh, also highlight the high quality of people I am lucky to work with. We have 230 people here on Kirchberg who do this, all this analysis. So I just mentioned the number one mega trend, which is uh, geopolitical fragmentation, geopolitical risk. The second one is climate change. For some reasons that I can understand a little bit Climate change uh, is, has become less fashionable uh, for some parties or for some politicians. But for us at the ESM, and we're not alone, for many uh, institutions and uh, analysts, uh, climate change remains a key megatrend. And uh, uh, the climate change issues are there to stay. To stay. Why are they there to stay? Not only because it can lead to extreme weather, uh, floods and, and high temperatures, to physical risks uh, and damages. It can also reduce our productivity. It also translates into the necessity to organize the transition risks. All this being said, uh, we need to prepare for the consequences of uh, climate change, including the issue of stranded assets, assets that can quickly lose their value because of climate change. And this, again, would lead to financial instability and job losses. My third point is aging population. This is obviously not a new topic. But <laughs> population aging has been with us since 30 or 40 years. But the consequences of this aging population are becoming more obvious, more clear, uh, more detrimental as the baby boomer generation now goes into pension. So first of all, this brings uh, along uh, slowing productivity. And uh, so our health and pension systems become uh, less resilient, to say it very nicely. In fact, in most countries, they are in deficit. Currently, in Europe, we have three workers for every re retiree. In 2050, we will have two workers for one retiree. For all of those who think that we do not need to act on this and, and think twice about it, these numbers, I think, are very compelling. 
there's many ways to, to tackle this. Obviously, you could say I, I need to reduce my uh, expenditures or my, uh, uh, my contributions or benefits in the pension system or, or the services uh, in the health system. Obviously, this is the first thing that comes to your mind because also life expectancy is increasing. But I think one has to have also more positive approaches, some uh, of which could be like increasing the participation rates of women. So having more jobs and definitely having more growth. Another topic which is key in this is migration. Now, uh, my, migration is a, a, a very credible avenue to boost labor markets. It has lots of challenges, and we know it's also a, a topic that receives a lot of attention in the mind of the public. In fact, in the Commission Eurobarometer survey I mentioned earlier, immigration is the second concern of Europeans. So we need to be aware with aging population, uh, unless we have an intelligent immigration policy, we will grow more slowly. And uh, so let's inspire ourselves from the best models of immigration that exist in Europe and outside uh, Europe. I hesitate, but I do it nevertheless to mention Luxembourg in this context. Yes, we have a lot of uh, immigration. Yes, it might be easier for a small country, but uh, it is impossible to grow without all the newcomers, uh, the 10 to 15,000 newcomers to Luxembourg every year, hundreds and hundreds of new students to our university every year. So it's only this openness that can ensure more growth and better growth in the future. I know it is a worry for a lot of people, but we need to have a serious reflection on how we want to do it at the European level. Let me now come to the third and last chapter, which I call possible solution and the potential role of the ESM. All the things I have uh, mentioned about Europe, Europe's growth, and, and productivity uh, are well recognized. Uh, and in a couple of days, there's going to be what is called the Mario Draghi report. Uh, and uh, the Mario Draghi report uh, is dedicated to the issue of uh, European productivity and competitiveness. And he has given us a little bit of a first glimpse uh, in Ghent in February of his report. And, uh, uh, according to his calculation, we have an investment gap in Europe of 500 billion euro per year for the whole of Europe uh, in order to organize the green and digital transition and, and just to be uh, more productive and competitive in the future. Now, 500 billion per year, this is public investment and private investment. I'm going to come back to this topic later. Now, wh where will we find, and here we are in the heart of the, the question that's being asked in the title, where are we going to find 500 billion euro uh, every year? Not on the street, not in the budget or in the budgets of most European countries, which have no buffers, which are already uh, at the limit. Fortunately, we have the new fiscal framework of the European Union, which will provide more space for reforms and investment. It will enter really into force next year. I look at Mariut, and we have the EIB, who is helping, uh, helping uh, to crowd in private investment uh, and has more means available. But uh, last but not least, the national government need to deliver on, uh, on what I would say a reasonable uh, budgetary discipline. And some countries have really very little room of maneuver. As we have seen a couple of days ago, the European Commission uh, issued uh, a document uh, where it opened uh, the excessive deficit procedure against seven countries, the seven countries being Belgium, 
France, Italy, and Malta, four countries inside the euro area, and three other EU countries, Hungary, Poland, and Slovakia. So these countries are exceeding the 3% maximum deficit for the yearly budget, and that's why this excessive deficit procedure has been opened. So keeping in mind that you need buffers uh, and uh, that these countries already are over the limit, you realize that to mobilize these 500 billions will be difficult, but a, a large part of the answer needs to happen at the European level. So in the last nine to 12 months, quite a few ideas have been flagged in, in different circumstances by different persons. So I'm going to mention a few because what I'm telling you is obviously not a surprise. It is in, in all the media. Let me start by uh, mentioning uh, Charles Michel, the president of the European Council, who suggested uh, to issue defense bonds. Obviously, this is connected to the issue uh, of security, uh, where he suggests uh, this uh, instrument. Enrico Letta, former uh, prime minister of Italy, dear yet, and uh, uh, who is the author of uh, the uh, report, which is called uh, Europe Much More Than a Market. Wonderful title. Yes, we are much more than a market. He suggests, amongst many other things, uh, that the ESM could establish a credit line to help its member countries finance their defense and security expenditures. He, su he suggests lots of other things, and I strongly recommend you to read his book because it's 147 pages. By the way, I saw him last week and he told me he, on top of the report, which is the 147 pages, he wrote also a book, which is a little bit thicker, where he also comments uh, how he got the ideas uh, while meeting lots of people in the 27 countries of the EU. I think it m could be also very interesting also for the university to, to look into that. And um, so the letter report, amongst others, uh, says that on top of the four liberties that are the core of the EU single market, the free movement of people, uh, uh, capital, goods and services, there should be a fifth leader liberty and on education and invisible uh, knowledge, uh, which is quite compelling. One of the things he mentions there, also look at the rector here, you probably are already aware of that because you saw him also, <clears throat> that is that we should make the uh, Erasmus project of exchange of students between universities in Europe uh, much more powerful and extend it uh, quite a lot and dedicate necessary financial resources to that. And the numbers to do that are enormous. Let me uh, then uh, also take this opportunity to highlight that the Luxembourg University is the number one in Europe in terms of Erasmus progress uh, students uh, exchange. Uh, I know a number that's maybe old, but uh, I, I think at the time there were 60%, 60% of students who would do the Erasmus program who are in Luxembourg, so nearly two thirds. And the statistic is also a couple of years old. The second country that does most exchanges is Austria. And have you any idea how much Austria does, who is the second best? 2%. So what Luxembourg does is visionary. That was your predecessor, Rolf Tarr, who said that. So in fact, at, at the Ulacasma University, it's nearly compulsory. Students are nearly forced to do it. I mean, there's a long way to get there. In but bachelor, it is mandatory. It is mandatory in bachelor, you see. And so what I want to say in, the, in this report of Letta, there's much more than just what uh, I highlight here, I encourage you to read it. Coming back to suggestions that were made, Olli Rehn, the governor of the Central Bank of Finland, suggested collecting funds from the ESM to fund aid to Ukraine. Jean-Claude Juncker, also our former prime minister and president of the commission, suggested the ESM could help Ukraine in one way or another. Uh, more recently, um, other, uh, more recently or very recently, the G7 found uh, a, a very uh, original way uh, to support uh, 
uh, Ukraine with a 50 billion uh, program. Uh, so just to show that the needs are huge and are needed uh, badly. So some other proposals I would like to highlight is, uh, for example, the last speech uh, at the Sorbonne of uh, Emmanuel Macron, the French president, who also suggested to use European financial stability mechanisms with an S uh, to finance investments. The same President Macron suggested that we should double the EU budget, double it. And it's a MFF, it's a multi-annual financial framework uh, a budget of the EU is a six-year program, comes to an end in 26. So he's talking about what comes after 26. So again, that was my remark in the beginning. I'm not going to go into all these suggestions, but it's just to show you that everyone is aware that we need a European financial response uh, uh, in, in, in the situation we're in. Paolo Gentiloni, the Italian commissioner whom I met yesterday, again, proposed that we need an EU-wide central fiscal capacity. Now, I, I agree with you, this is a very complicated name, but basically it's to say you need European funds on a general basis uh, in these times. Uh, Fabio Panetta, the executive board member of the ECB, calls for something similar. What does that all indicate? And here I'm in the heart of the topic and of the title, and it is that uh, focusing more on EU level financing to tackle all the major challenges I mentioned, and especially the three megatrends, is unavoidable. So um, let me now, in, the, in this last part of my presentation, just highlight uh, the ideas that have a link with the ESM and to see what the ESM in itself can do. So, First of all, uh, we have a firepower or a lending capacity of 500 billion euro, out of which 422 billion euro are available. So in these challenging times, obviously this is a lot of money, how can that be used? You have heard in the proposals that were made by some uh, that uh, the idea floats that we should help Ukraine directly. Now, this sounds very uh, intuitive, but this is not possible. The, Europe, the, S, the ESM is there to support its 20 member countries. So we cannot help directly Ukraine, to say it in very simple words. That would require a treaty change. Let's therefore leave this idea aside for a moment, and let's see what the ESM could do in its existing mandate, that means towards its own member countries. So first, the idea of Enrico Letta, uh, of a uh, defense, uh, which would be a credit line for defense and security expenditures. So Enrico Letta there draws a comparison with the pandemic crisis support that the ESM had suggested itself back in 2020 uh, um, to, uh, in fact, help the countries of the euro area finance health-related costs due to the pandemic. And so uh, what happened at the time, and I was at the time in the Board of Governors of the ESM, it was a reasoning that was very simple to say because of the lockdown of the economy of all the countries uh, in Europe, we will have uh, risks of financial instability. And that's why we have the European stability mechanism. That's why we should have such a product, such a credit <laughs> line. Now, the parallel that uh, Enrico Letta is doing is saying, well, uh, the, to, to, we should create something similar for the expenditures that are going to be triggered by the security and defense needs. What, is that possible? Yes, it is possible, but uh, it's important to understand how this would work uh, in the ESM. We would need to have a consensus by the 20 member countries to do so in the same way as we had a consensus back in 2020 for the uh, expenditures related uh, to health. Uh, and obviously, uh, it, it would mean that uh, you would draw the conclusion that the uh, 
geopolitical uh, tension and the war in Ukraine are triggering uh, financial instability in all or in some uh, member countries of uh, the EU. Now, uh, I could give you an example uh, that, uh, that we have already seen, and that is that countries that are very close to the border uh, of Russia are uh, forced to pay a risk premium because of their geographic location. So you could say, well, if the situation persists, these countries are penalized. And despite having a good economic policy, good fiscal policies, because, which is the case of some of them, uh, they could uh, ask uh, the ESM for support. This would be what we call in our jargon precautionary um, loans or instruments. Uh, and that would uh, help prevent financial crisis. So we have not only macroeconomic programs with heavy conditionality, as we have done with the five countries we supported back in the last decade, Greece, Spain, Portugal, Cyprus, and Ireland. But here, it would be a kind of precautionary instrument to prevent a crisis. It would work a little bit like an insurance. To tell you in a few words, DSM is ready to work with its member countries on such an idea. The second proposal, which is also uh, in the letter report, would uh, be uh, that uh, we aggregate all European issuances under the same name. So we have three institutions in Europe that issue bonds, which are European labeled. It's the European Investment Bank, it's the European Commission, and it's the ESM. Together, we have already issued more than a trillion of bonds, which are considered safe assets. And so, to reinforce this uh, idea of European safe assets, the letter report uh, encourages us to, to have a, a similar name. It, is too, it would be too long to dwell on it, but just I wanted to mention it uh, because it is an interesting idea. Third thing, the financing of investment. Could the ESM finance investment? This could be tri triggering a treaty change because what we do uh, as ESM is support the finances of our member countries. So it's budget support. So unless the scope of loans would be narrowed for the purpose of addressing financial stability risks, as this was the case in the pandemic crisis support, or could be eventually the case with what I said with security and defense expenditures, we are not there to uh, support individual investments like the EIB, for example, does. Fourth proposal, a central fiscal capacity. Uh, could the ESM provide that? Uh, in November 2022, the ESM itself proposed the creation of a stability fund. It would have, in fact, the function uh, that is suggested, for example, by Commissioner uh, Gentiloni, and it would then uh, issue loans on favorable terms and be activated in the event of external shocks, like we have one now uh, with the war in Ukraine. We could do such a task, uh, and uh, uh, we can obviously only do that for the Euro area member countries. No treaty change would be required for that. And it would be relatively easy to be set up in terms of administration, not least because existing ESM infrastructure could be used. Finally, uh, let me uh, add a, a comment to all of this to show that we are very active on reflecting on this. Uh, we had the Board of Governors uh, last week uh, here in Luxembourg uh, at our uh, headquarters uh, where we presented what uh, we call a toolkit review, which in fact uh, is a review of our financial instruments. We have seven such instruments, and we presented that to the finance ministers who are our governors. And um, 
what we want to achieve with this exercise is to double check if the instruments that were invented uh, a dozen of years ago, 15 years ago nearly, are still fit for purpose. Uh, one thing is certain is that the crisis change over time in nature and in scope. So that's why you need to do this exercise of reviewing your instruments, instruments on a regular basis. The IMF has uh, done it uh, recently. We have uh, done it. We have focused a lot here on the precautionary instruments I mentioned before, because preventing a crisis is far less expensive, expensive than helping a country that is already, already at a cliff edge. And uh, mentioning the different types of crises, and we all have in mind now security and defense, but you could also think of climate change as being uh, an external risk that is definitely there, but would come, could become uh, more powerful in terms of negative consequences. And obviously, we need to also double check if our instruments could be used in, the, those, uh, in those cases. Um, let me um, maybe say uh, at the end uh, a word uh, to the importance of private investment. Uh, obviously, what I have just alluded to is what the ESM can do, that is public investment. But obviously, uh, private investment is key. Uh, of the 500 billion of Mario Draghi that I mentioned before, you could say that probably around 20% needs to be public investment. All the rest is from the private sector. And so what can we do to attract more uh, uh, finance uh, in the, the, the investments that Europe needs? One important factor would be to have a capital markets union. I'm not going to go into the details of this. Uh, we have discussed this in the Eurogroup that I attend every month on a regular basis. And the Eurogroup has uh, recently agreed on a roadmap to achieve this, and I encourage you to have a look at that. So uh, capital markets union would be a European a contribution, uh, an, an indirect one, if you want, and coming from the private sector. Another thing, and that I get now very close to my conclusion, is obviously to boost growth. We need to boost growth. And uh, <clears throat> one answer uh, is the LETA report, strengthening the single market. Now, let me say a few words on, on the way this can be misunderstood or, and the way it should be understood. When we say <coughs> we need to boost the EU single market, it can sound in the eyes and in the ears of people that the EU single market hasn't worked, that we need to redo it. It's not that it hasn't worked. It has wonderfully worked. It was the major engine growth of Europe. But the economy has changed. Things that we uh, resolved in, 1993, in the 90s uh, with the 80s and 90s with the EU single market uh, were fine. But there was no artificial intelligence. There was no, no digital investments. There were no cryptocurrencies, and so on, and so on. So we need to update, to do an aggiornamento of the EU single market. That's what it is about. So the idea in itself was an excellent one. We need to modernize it. And I think there's great consensus uh, about this, and there's a lot of potential to this. And this will boost productivity and competitiveness. But that alone will not do the trick. Everyone will have to do his homework. That means do the necessary structural reforms in his own country. Now, very few politicians dwell on that. There's always the tendency to say, Europe should do, Europe can here, others can. But let's face it, uh, everyone has also to do its homework. So in the Eurogroup debates, um, this message sometimes is a little bit forgotten. So that's why I mention it here. Europe alone cannot do the trick. This uh, presentation was dedicated to the fact that we can be innovative in terms of in, uh, in terms of financing through Europe, for sure. There's lots of things that can be done, but there's a lot of responsibility also in the member countries. So I'm not going to summarize in the conclusion all the things I've said. I'm just going to conclude to tell you that uh, 
I, I would be inspired if we would remember uh, my presentation uh, with the formula and the words of Winston Churchill, who said the pessimist sees difficulty in every opportunity. The optimist sees opportunity in every difficulty. Let me reassure you, the ESM definitely is an optimistic institution. Thank you. Now, does it work? Yes. Okay, yes. thanks. Mr. Gamenia, thanks a lot for your inspiring speech, which was very dense of hints, suggestions. You raised quite a lot of points, which are of uh, quite a lot of interest for many of us. So I would invite you to make questions. Uh, please take the floor, stand up, say your name and institution, please. Hello, uh, Sebastian Huin, European Investment Bank. Uh, I have. Off. Turn it on, please. Uh, my question is um, uh, uh, please explain us uh, how uh, would be managed the bankruptcy of a huge bank like BNP Paribas or Deutsche Bank? Uh, well, you want uh, to respond directly, or maybe we collect? Okay. Oh, well, I can, I can take this one. That's, uh, that's never going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Too big to fail. Yes. Okay. Now, now more seriously, uh, uh, the, the, we have learned from the sovereign debt crisis uh, quite a lot of things, and I haven't mentioned in, in the nevertheless quite uh, extensive summary all the things that Europe has done as a response to this uh, uh, crisis, uh, the banking union. And in the banking uh, union, uh, there's uh, lots of things that have been agreed. And one of them is that uh, there, was, there was a common um, willingness of countries that in case of failure of a bank, it should not be taxpayers' money that should save the banks. In order to have another solution for that, uh, a single resolution fund was established uh, in all the countries, depending on the size of banks and deposits. And uh, between 2016 and 2024, uh, all countries collected that money from the banks, and they have collected uh, close to 80 billion euro, which are in the single resolution fund. Now, um, in a, a treaty uh, which amends or adds to our fun founding treaty, uh, um, the ESM has also the task to give an additional layer of protection, uh, and it's called the backstop to the single resolution fund, and we have earmarked 68 billion euro uh, for the same purpose. Uh, and so that nearly doubles the available money and uh, let me also say that if we were to use uh, that additional amount, this would again need be reimbursed by banks. So we have set up something that is rather unique in the world because it's transnational. It is a U European wide system, uh, by the way, to which not only the Euro area countries are there, but uh, the EU 27 uh, through bridges. Uh, this being said, uh, what is a key is that uh, we uh, have now banks which are supervised, uh, the largest banks are supervised uh, uh, by the national authorities together with the European Central Bank uh, to have, uh, uh, I think, a more thorough uh, monitoring of the banks. And last but not least, if you look at the buffers that our banks have accumulated, uh, being for liquidity or for, for capital, these buffers are among the highest in the world. So that's why my answer was that it will never happen, but never is never happening. Thank you. Yeah. Here. Our host. 
Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for this uh, fascinating uh, speech. My, my question is just a semantic issue. When you, meant, uh, you spoke about uh, the objective of the ESM, you mentioned not only stability, but also solidarity, I, I know. And I remember, not so long ago, a conference at the ESM with the participation of the president of the court, who himself qualified ESM as solidarity mechanism. Uh, you have a very good staff, a very good lawyer, but could we give now an interpretation uh, according which stability is just an intermediate objective, but the final uh, pre-existing <laughs> uh, reality is that it is a, a solidarity mechanism. Sorry. That's an excellent question. I love it. I was in the room when that happened. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, the, the, the judge, uh, the EU judge uh, of the Court of Justice said, yes, there is the Pringle court case uh, for, uh, about the ESM, and then he spells out ESM standing for European, Stabili uh, European Solidarity Mechanism. And nobody noticed, uh, unlucky for him, I was there, so I highlighted that, but in a joking mode. And uh, you know, this uh, quid pro quo or this lapses uh, was uh, one of these nice things that happened in conferences. Because uh, I said to him, you know, you're not wrong. It's not what it stands for. But that's what it's all about. But, uh, Etienne, I would say the goal is not solidarity. The goal is stability. And to achieve stability, you need solidarity. So I am completely with you. Uh, so I think the name is correct. We are there to ensure the financial stability. The word stability is meant for financial stability uh, because that safeguards the euro area. And in order to get there, well, we support countries. Supporting countries is having solidarity uh, with countries. So uh, I think this, this lapsus was uh, very telling, and I'm glad you highlight that. There was one question from there first. There. Hello, uh, I'm a student at the Leinster Lucia International School and part of the European Youth Parliament. And in that context, uh, I worked on a, a committee on press freedom. And we had the opportunity to talk to a war journalist. She's called Joanna de Rijke from the Netherlands. And uh, she was captured by the Taliban, actually, and uh, only had the chance to come free because uh, because the French government uh, paid some money. So um, this is definitely a challenge that more and more journalists are uh, facing um, violence. So I was wondering if that could also be um, a possibility to use uh, yeah, the funds. And there's this idea of creating a fund um, which can be used for situations like that. Um, however, it is a very complex question because um, other people also say it might um, yeah, increase the possibility of kidnappings because it makes it more attractive if there is a fund behind it um, for terrorists. Uh, so I would like to know, know your opinion on that, how we can uh, tackle this problem. Thank you. There is, there is a problem of moral, moral hazard. No. Yep. No, I think that was just they not struck me. So good. Hello? No. I, I spoke too much. No, Maybe. No. Yeah. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. Okay. For Patushi. The micro got tired of me. Um, not, I, yet. not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. No, you know, it, it happens uh, often in, in such conferences uh, that, that you get questions you are not uh, prepared for. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, the, uh, the imagination goes really beyond what you can prepare for. So uh, what, what I, I want to say very seriously, uh, this is a, a serious topic, but definitely uh, one that needs be tackled behind closed doors. Because every time you pay a ransom, 
every country that does that will always deny that they pay a ransom. Then you have to make up your mind if they really did pay one or did not pay one. So uh, having said that, this is a serious topic, but definitely not one that has ever been thought of by us as uh, the team in the ESM and certainly not in the mind uh, of uh, uh, our forefathers and, and founders of the ESM. Uh, and last but not least, on, on a very serious note, uh, what I have maybe not uh, dwelled uh, sufficiently upon is the following. The ESM needs be used when there's a risk of financial instability in one or more countries of the euro area. So I think what you're alluding to uh, is not triggering uh, any uh, financial instability risk in a member country or in the whole uh, area. Um, and, and so it would really not qualify at all for our task. Yep. Alfred Steinhardt. Uh, honorary Chief Economist of the European Investment Bank and founding rector of the University of Bolzano. I uh, put the yeah, micro yeah, closer. I, yeah. I would like to comment <clears throat> on the need for 500 billion annual additional investment. You know, financial institutions, they uh, collect money from uh, savers directly or through the capital market, and that can then be lent on. So, Whatever you do to financial institutions, uh, this will not generate the additional 500 billion. Uh, banks can allocate it differently, but there is an amount of savings that is being used for investment, private and public, deficits of governments, and foreign investments. And it so happens that the European Union is a major net investor abroad. So if you want to find 500 additional million, either you, incentives are created for Europeans to save more, for governments to, lend, to make smaller deficits, or to make lesser net surpluses through our trade with the rest of the world. But whatever you do to the financial market, that may increase the efficiency, but that doesn't generate 500 billion. You may give more money to the EM, to ESM, then that money will missing to others. You're just reallocating, but you are not creating additional resources. Thanks. Well, if I may, I mean, I just remind uh, our colleague and guest that uh, we also had some economists called John Maynard Keynes who talked about the multipliers, fiscal multipliers. So depending on uh, what you invest on your money, it can generate more money, and so it becomes, I mean, it, it becomes growth, but please to respond. Well, well, yeah, no, no, thank you very much for, for mentioning John Maynard Keynes, uh, I think uh, probably the most innovative uh, economist of the 20th century and maybe uh, of the whole uh, history of economists. He's less fashionable uh, since uh, uh, the, 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 the 80s, but uh, I think we have uh, to a large extent to rediscover him uh, in this century. This being said, Alfred, thank you for, nice to see you again, and thank you for, for the, the excellent question. Um, I will uh, give a, a, a few s comments to your question, not challenging completely what you said, because I, it's certainly true to a certain extent, uh, especially because you mentioned at one time maybe we need more savings. Europe is the world champion of savings, probably with China and, and Japan although I do not know the latest numbers, but we save enormously, especially in the pandemic times. And, and still now, uh, four years after the pandemic, the ratio of savings is higher than it was prior to the pandemic. And uh, the, the, str the strange thing is that we are not good at, and when I say we as observers or politicians or international financial institutions, it is very difficult to understand or to have a convincing explanation why we cannot transform those savings into investment. So you can also blame the banks. Some people hate banks, so they blame the banks. But uh, it's a bit short. 
maybe banks are risk averse. Now, to tell you the truth, they have to have buffers here in Europe that are higher than in the rest of the world. Uh -huh. Yes, it's good for the security and the safety of banks uh, and the resilience of banks on the one hand, but then they need to be more cautious. So I, I don't want to leave the banks completely off the hook, but uh, certainly they need to be more careful than in other parts of the world because of these regulations and surveillance and think of Basel III, for example. Uh, point number two, I think, Alfred, uh, I'm, I went a bit fast on this. Uh, we need public investment and private. And the ratio is, I mentioned, 80 to 20. Some say it's two-thirds, one-third. and it's, There's no clear-cut evidence of what the number really is. But it's clear that the major part is private investment. And what I think we have seen with the uh, European Investment Bank is an excellent uh, example. What happens? Uh, with public money, so the money that the countries put into the European Investment Bank, uh, we were able over decades uh, to uh, boost uh, and um, boost and uh, make possible investments that otherwise would not have been done by the private sector. So, in other words, uh, thanks to the public intervention, you have a leverage effect and a de-risking effect. So I think that's something in Europe that we are very keen on and uh, that I think we, we could and should uh, pursue even more. Um, I give you also the example of the functioning of uh, the ESM, which I didn't have the opportunity to say, and you probably know it, Alfred, but for the benefit uh, of the others, we issue loans for the countries we want to support. But the way we do that is by having a paid-in capital of 81 billion euro, which all the member countries of the euro area have paid in, and these 81 billion, we manage these 81 billion, we don't spend them. That is our guarantee for the markets. And thanks to these 81 billions, we can lend up to 500 billions on the market at a triple A rating. And this low level of interest rates, we pass over to the countries we support. So our capital remains intact. So it's this leveraging effect which is important. So in other words, it is important to find a way to crowd in the private investment through such mechanism as the EIB has for individual projects. This being said, what I said, uh, my first part of the answer is how can we, uh, how can we uh, make sure that our banks in Europe particularly uh, are more, have more tendency to uh, finance uh, productive and competitive projects. Last but not least, let's not forget, because uh, we speak about uh, public versus private, about liberalism eventually versus more uh, European uh, socialist uh, approach. Look at what the United States is doing. This is the, the 360 billion euro uh, IRA program uh, is a spectacular Keynesian uh, instrument. Spectacular. To such an extent that European companies are investing a lot in the United States thanks to that public investment. So there is no, for me this must and should not be a political discussion if you're left or right, liberal or not. I think we should inspire ourselves of new models where you can have a smart interaction between uh, public and private financing. Okay, Duman, uh, first, sorry. Yeah. Oh, question to the, what you just saying. Yeah, yeah, first, maybe. Sure. Hi, my name is Stefan Kohler. I'm the president of Europa Union Luxembourg, not for profit organization for Europe, independent and in Luxembourg. Regarding the paid-in capital, you just mentioned it. The ESM has more than 80 billion of paid-in capital from the, its members. And you have currently outstanding uh, loans, if I'm not mistaken, of less than 80 billion. In addition, of course, you have the firepower indeed to support for more than 400 billion. 
which itself helps to calm the market and which was actually the very idea behind the EFSF and then the ESM to, to calm the market and it was successful in that. Of, on the other hand, it's of course obvious with these numbers that you have paid in capital which is higher than your loans outstanding, how to deploy that capital actually and how to make even better use of it. The question I have, how likely is it that it will be used in the near future um, with some of these proposals on the table? And secondly, what would be done if it doesn't happen? Because at some point, I don't think it's efficient that you have public money just sitting there and then not really using it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is an excellent question. Can you repeat the institution you're in or the association? I didn't understand. Europa Union. Europa Union Luxembourg. Oh, okay. Uh, so, a uh, couple of things here. Um, we are first and foremost an insurance. So if you have a fire insurance uh, uh, to protect your house and uh, your house doesn't burn for many years, are you cancelling your insurance? Or you have an insurance and your house burns the second year and then you're really happy that you are having insurance. And then, after two more years, you cancel the insurance because you said, well, I was lucky, I had an insurance, now I don't need it anymore. So, you have to understand that this paid in capital, yes, it is public money, yes, it allows to issue bonds, but that money is there. It's not even spent. It's the most intelligent way of supporting uh, or safeguarding a, a, a a country or uh, in this case 20 countries compared to what other international financial institutions do. By the way, we have a network of regional financial arrangements like there's an Arab Monetary Fund, there's a FLAR in South America. We are in contact with those. They all recognize that we are lucky to have this paid in capital and a system that is extremely credible uh, and helps us, and we've seen it with the five countries we have uh, supported, not only to do it without additional cost for countries because the, they have paid in the capital, but for the rest it doesn't cost them anything. And the countries that get the support, they reimburse all the loans that they get. So it's a very efficient system. There is another part of your question, and uh, it's equally important, and that is uh, of all the ideas that have been mentioned here, uh, what is the likelihood that some of them uh, materialize? Well, the simple answer is they will materialize when 20 countries, the 20 member countries uh, of the ESM agree to utilize one of the seven instruments for a specific purpose. So, uh, Obviously, we are an intergovernmental institution. You need consensus. We have shown in the last decade that uh, this works, and I'm confident that this can work in the future. Last but not least, the ESM shouldn't be seen as being really eager whenever a crisis is at the horizon to say, hey, wait a minute, here we are. We, we, we are the firefighters, and, and this is... This is also not uh, the, the role. You can say it, we are the lender of last resort, or you can say it differently, we are also there for precautionary loans to prevent crisis. So there's different way to look at it. So um, why do I think that defense and uh, security and defense is an important topic uh, at the present juncture is because I think that this uh, security and defense risk is there to stay in the medium and long term. And if it stays in the medium and long term, the amount of money that is needed for that is quite huge. And that's why I highlighted that despite the fact that the new stability and growth pact rules are new and slightly more flexible and allow for more investment, the room of maneuver of many countries is very limited. So for me, this is the kind of essence of for, of topic where it is worthwhile finding a European answer. So I think with this I've covered all the angles of your excellent question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Giovanni.
I think it's the last one they told me. If maybe I take also that very quickly. Thank you so much. Giovanni Farese, European University of, of Rome. Um, I see ideas are there and uh, the means, the financial means are, are there. My question is, and I'll probably go back to some of the questions that have already been asked, is how much political will you see to go in, in, in the direction. Uh, let me just repeat what you mentioned in the letter report. Mr. Letta says that in Europe there are 33 trillion euros in private savings, predominantly held in current account, which is double the size of, of the GDP of the whole EU, which means that there's, there's a paradox. Europe is a rich area in which we have underinvestment. And, and my guess is that the, the capital markets unit is important, but unless we have a European safe asset, which is Eurobonds, uh, the, the problem is not going to be fixed uh, in terms of common projects for common investment. So uh, how many leaders do you see around the table from your experience, or how many leaders have you seen around the table that think that these are uh, the visionary hopes of uh, poets, to use your father's uh, word? Thank you. Thank you, Giovanni. Uh, this is also a, a very good question, and it's more a political question. Um, and as I said at the end, I am uh, I'm definitely an optimist. Uh, I would like just to refer to the recent history. Uh, and the recent history is uh, when... Uh, <laughs> recent history is we did not have an ESM. That means we created a common currency back in 1999 without having a lender of last resort, without thinking that we need an institution to safeguard the euro area. Interesting. So when the first heavy crisis comes, we realize, oh, we, we have a missing link in the chain. We, we I say we, to simplify, countries knocked at the door of the IMF, and the IMF said, sorry guys, I mean, we're not there for such situations, uh, and, and what is required in terms of means to support rich countries as yours goes beyond what we have available in the IMF. Number two, hey guys, I, again, I simplify on purpose because intellectually it's simple, you have a common currency, you should help yourself. That's how the ESM was created. So the ESM was created after a crisis. So it cannot be more a crisis instrument than being created because of a crisis. Now that we have the instrument, I think we, we could and we should leverage it. And the pandemic crisis support instrument I mentioned uh, was such an answer, and there was consensus in the lockdown period to use it. It was finally not really triggered and used by countries. Why? Because there were so many other measures in place. The NGEU, the guarantees of the European Investment Bank, and the 0% interest rate policy, a commodative monetary policy of the ECB. And NGU, remember, half of it is grants. When you go to the ESM, it's loans. You have to reimburse them. So for those reasons, it was not really used. So I want to say we have one example where this readiness to, to propose something has been uh, shown, was accepted by 20 countries. So why would it not happen in the future? Now, uh, The pandemic is for me an excellent example because it's an external shock, something that you cannot control. The same goes for the war in Ukraine and uh, geopolitical instability. If that external shock, shock is there to stay, Europe needs to find also a European answer. If Europe finds an answer which would be we do a defense agency for Europe in which we send billions of euros. Fine. If we double the EU budget, as was suggested by Macron, sorry, for President Macron, and if, if we were to say, and half of that budget should be to have a European defense policy, I'm fine with it. I'm fine. It's not about me. I think the, the, the ESM would not be there saying, wait a minute, no, 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 we want to do that. No. I mean, if we recognize we want to do this together, this is about really European financing initiatives, 
then we should do that. Are we at that juncture? I don't think we're at that juncture yet to do such an agency. Could it be smart to say, oh, we have the ESM, which has some firepower, which is the right word in this context. <laughs> um, they have some funds available uh, to start uh, something along those lines. I think it is worthwhile exploring. And uh, fortunately or unfortunately, we are 20 member countries and we are intergovernmental. That means we need to have a consensus of 20 countries. But that sounds tougher than it is. Because, I mean, if France and Germany, for example, would say, I think the ESM here should be called in, I, I suppose that many other countries would think, and if those countries realize this is necessary, I suppose the others are also going to, to, to see it. So uh, we are not there to rush. We need to build consensus. I spend most of my time speaking with our member countries about a smart use uh, of what of the instrument we have. The smart use meaning, depending on the shocks we're facing, one should not forget the ESM and we as an institution, as managing director with my team, we're always ready to sit down and see how we can help. Thank you. The last question, yes. Coming. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gramia. I have a question. Two weeks ago, at your seat, was sitting a very powerful woman. She was the European prosecutor, and she made a very nice presentation. She mentioned that she's working hard, and I really believe in her and her commitment. But despite her commitment, she said that she's able, you know, annually to collect two percent of uh, the money on the hands of the criminals in Europe. And uh, she also mentioned corruption. So how would you link the confidence of 98% of uh, this missing money with your job? Thank you. Yes, this is uh, uh, also a question that's really far away from the remit of the ESM. But as a citizen, I have an opinion on this. Uh, this 2% that we collect is certainly not enough. But those 2%, because it is a European public prosecutor, should go in European initiatives. And the more we collect, the better, and that should definitely go into European uh, institutions for whatever good uh, destination and goal we, we, we want to have. And, and in fact, that we have a European prosecutor uh, who was then, uh, then sitting here two, two weeks ago. Uh, if you had asked me, as an optimist, and, and many others 10 or 15 years ago, that we would ever have a European public prosecutor, you would have been considered a dreamer. This is never going to happen. That's what most people would answer. So um, NGEU, the solidarity, the, so I think we have quite a few examples where Europe raises up to the challenges or, and, uh, and finds solution, as Jean Monnet said, and I think we are in that state of mind, and uh, I will never despair of Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much. There are, of course, many other questions. I'm sure, unfortunately, the time uh, is finished. Uh, and uh, expectations about the, the use, the possible different uses of the ESM are many. Because, of course, you cited the, the 71 uh, billion of capital paid in. But you, you have a subscribed capital of more than 700 uh, a billion euros. So if you think of the leverage that are you, you're using now, you, think, you might think about four trillions that might be uh, put into the, into the service of this uh, architecture for providing uh, European public goods, because basically you were talking about European public goods, struggle against climate change, uh, European security and defense, and this kind of things. But anyway, the time is over. Uh, thank you very much for your splendid speech. And uh, we now leave the floor to Bernard Snoy for his concluding remarks. Mr. Managing Director, Mr. Director, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, let me first of all thank all the organizers of uh, this evening uh, for doing this in cooperation with the Robert Triffin 
International um, Association. We are really very grateful that this great speech and this debate that we have had is associated with the name of Robert Triffin and with um, the, the important uh, causes for which all over his life he militated. Now, I don't know perhaps how much each of the persons here in the room know about the Belgian-American uh, economist, uh, Robert um, uh, Triffin, who made a number of uh, very important contributions um, in all the international monetary and economic initiatives after World War II. Uh, he was one of the um, inventors of the European Payments Union, which made possible the return uh, to uh, multilateralism in trade at the time of the Marshall Plan. He was a friend here in Luxembourg of uh, Pierre Werner. He was a friend of Jean Monnet uh, at a different moment in the um, construction of Europe, for instance, when we had uh, to construct the exchange rate mechanism of the European monetary system, he contributed to finding clever solutions, solutions coming a little bit out of the box. Uh, he is also one of the fathers of the special drawing rights. Of course, the main, his main interest in his academic um, career and in the, um, the advice that he, he gave to important uh, politicians in America, in Europe, was the good functioning of the international monetary system. And probably you may have heard that he is the inventor of the so-called Trifin Dilemma, which says that when the currency of one particular country is used as the global currency, it can never serve properly the needs at the same time of the economy of the country issuing that currency and the need of the international economy. And um, he was right. Uh, in fact, the, the original Bretton Woods system collapsed in 71. Um, we, introduced, we moved into some sort of a non-system and uh, he was always uh, linking many of the, of the problems that we have encountered since then to the absence of a response to that uh, dilemma. In uh, 2002, an international association was uh, created in Belgium based in the University of Louvain, Louvain-la-Neuve, Louvain uh, to perpetuate his intellectual heritage. And um, the president and founder was Alexandre Lamfaloussi, a, a great uh, international person who, who was the, presi the president of the European Monetary Institute after having been managing director of the Bank for uh, International Settlement. And a few years later, uh, we launched what we call the Trifin 21 Initiative. That is to demonstrate that Trifin is not only a subject for historians or people who are looking into his archives, but uh, that his fundamental ideas have great relevance for the problems of the 21st century. And that was the moment when we initiated Trifin Lectures. And we are very pleased, Mr. Gramenia, that you accepted to give us today this magnificent Trifin Lecture. The first um, uh, speaker who gave the, the, the first Trifin Lecture in 2010 was Tommaso Padoa Schiopa, who had been in the um, uh, executive board of the European Central Bank, who was later on uh, Minister of Finance of uh, Italy. And the topic which is still with us, was the link between the, at that time, that was the great economic and financial crisis, but we are in a world 
perpetually threatened by new crises. The link between those crises and precisely what he called the global monetary disorder. And we are still with that. In the meantime, we have had uh, uh, Michel Candessus, Jacques Delarosière, uh, Jean Lemierre, um, and many other very prominent uh, speakers to, um, uh, to, to talk um, uh, to us. Um, we supported in 2010 the so-called Palais Royal Initiative. It was, in fact, launched by Michel Candessu, a former managing director of the, of the IMF, Alexandre Lamfalusi, and Tommaso Padoaschiopa. They brought together uh, more than 20 uh, former uh, central bank governors, including Paul Volcker, who signed a report giving a number of very concrete steps that had to be done to reform the international monetary system. Unfortunately, uh, this report coincided, it was published in 2011, with the onset of the sovereign debt crisis in the Eurozone, and to be honest, the report was shelved. We continued to promote these ideas, to complement this report, for instance, by um, a, a report on how the special drawing rights could become a lever to reform the international monetary uh, system. Uh, we were always concerned, like Robert Triffin was, with the notion that international liquidity is an international public good that needs to be managed. And we published a report on that subject that you can find uh, on the, the website of our um, uh, organization. Last year, again, uh, Michel Candessu, together with um, Indian economist Anup Singh and myself, we published a new, um, let's say, uh, document on the essential reform of the international monetary system, coming with a number of ideas like um, more fairness in the governance of the International Monetary Fund, um, enlargement of the mandate of the IMF, for instance, uh, in its role of lender of last resort, in its uh, role of sup multilateral supervision, including on, um, on capital flows, on its role in the case of uh, sovereign debt um, rescheduling, so we continue to be active. We organize regularly uh, conferences. We had, uh, in May, a big conference uh, in Lisbon with Banco de Portugal and uh, Academy of Science of Lisbon on the topics of regionalism and multilateralism. Because that is also a characteristic of um, Robert Triffin's thought. When uh, reforms are blocked at the global level, and to be honest, now the international system is more unraveling, or as Mr. Gramenia said, we are in a danger of very serious geopolitical or geoeconomic fragmentation, which involves a significant cost for all. But perhaps we can act more at a regional level. And we talked about regional monetary unions, regional monetary arrangements. And of course, it's good that we are here today in Luxembourg, since the European stability mechanism is by far the most elaborate mechanism of uh, uh, cooperation. Let me come perhaps to some of what we could call the takeaways of the remarkable conference that we have uh, uh, heard and, uh, and the debate that uh, followed. I think we will all remember a number of key words. The first one, Mr. Gramenia, and I like it very much, is trust. Trust or, or confidence. Nothing great can happen unless the people have confidence in the elite, unless uh, we can have confidence in the institutions that have been created to defend our, our common good. And there is, for that, a great need, as you said, of pedagogy. Uh, understanding, explanation. Um, and the next word, of course, is the historical perspective that you have given. We cannot separate uh, the need 
to uh, explain where we stand from the, the move that we have seen. And the main lesson of history, as you said, is the resilience of the European project. And you quoted uh, Jean Monnet saying that uh, Europe is the, the sum of the response to all the crises. And Europe, uh, uh, despite all the doomsayers, has managed always to transform crises into uh, opportunities. The next uh, word we will remember, of course, it is in, the, in the, the title, it is the challenges, the new challenges, the evolving challenges. We always have had um, big uh, uh, challenges. It's not uh, obvious um, to, uh, to bring together 20 countries with one currency, it requires convergence, which is very difficult to, um, to, to, to reach. It requires the respect of a certain number of rules, including the famous um, uh, uh, fiscal rules. But to these challenges, to the challenges that come also from the inherent instability of financial markets, uh, or banking crises can come back, and also let us be mindful of crises that may come from non-banking financial intermediaries. On top of that, we have seen a series of, of, of crises. Um, the, the COVID and the Ukraine have been mentioned, but we stand uh, in front of the perhaps a, the huge, the, the most huge uh, uh, crisis, which comes from the, the climate uh, transition, and not only the questions of climate, but it is associated with the great dangers to biodiversity, which conditions the survival also of, of mankind, and the basic issue identified by the Club of Rome, which are the limitations in the resources of the, of the planet. This requires a huge adaptation. Adaptation means also investments, and, and if we fail to adapt, we will have a crisis for which uh, we will need institutions such as yours, then uh, aging, aging, demography, uh, pensions, um, health, health care uh, for European countries, contrary to, to Africa or other parts of the world, um, uh, a huge. And then, of course, uh, geopolitical fragmentation is, is not only geoeconomic geo or political, it is geomilitary. And so we have uh, now to invest more uh, in security and defense. And we have to contemplate um, a, some fallback from globalization to secure, to secure our, um, uh, our access uh, to, to resources. And therefore, we enter in a completely new type of, um, uh, of world. The, the challenge in moving from one stage to the other are enormous and add to the already existing um, uh, challenges. And what, of course, was refreshing was to see that there is here in Luxembourg this institution, the European Stability Mechanism, which not only has been successful for what it has done in the past, but is creative, is broadening the, the range of its uh, instruments, and is thinking about what it could do more. And we are really impressed by uh, what, what you said, and also by the um, sources where you get inspiration. I think we should all read the Enrico Letta uh, report, extremely um, uh, important. See, uh, we've also the, the suggestions that he is uh, making that perhaps the European stability mechanism could have a role in the financing of uh, military expenditures. We, we, we look forward to reading soon the Draghi report on uh, competitiveness and industrial policy. By the way, industrial policy is going to cost a lot of money. And we see that already in the United States. And if the, the European Union wants to, to keep up, that will be an additional uh, pressure uh, on, um, uh, on, on finances and stability. By the way, when we were in Lisbon, we heard a very interesting um, keynote speech of uh, your former um, colleague, a Portuguese minister 
uh, of, um, of, um, of I know not uh, Centeno, but Gaspar, Vitor Gaspar, who is now the head of the Fiscal Affairs Department of the IMF. And he mentioned a trilemma, which I'm afraid all politicians must have in their mind, because we face at the same time very strong, where well, I have soon to finish, spending uh, pressures, uh, very big political red lines against new taxation, and the need uh, for uh, um, uh, fiscal, no, for um, sorry, financial uh, uh, sustainability and stability. And he said one of the three has to give. The same is true, by the way, about energy, where you have another trilemma, where you, you need to have at the same time security of supply, uh, um, affordability of, of energy, and ecological transition. Okay, so the, the, the challenges are absolutely huge. I, we heard you also saying that, of course, the European stability mechanism has to do that in a global framework. Now, and there are many other European institutions, European Central Bank, here in Luxembourg, the European Investment Bank, but also the private sector. And that is perhaps the greatest of all the challenges and how to enlist uh, the private um, uh, investors in, um, in this huge, huge task. Uh, and the last, uh, perhaps, uh, important word to remember is political will. This will be possible not only when generous and enlightened people like Mr. Gramenia propose things, but also when the um, responsible people at all the national levels uh, do their homework their homework of convergence and their homework of uh, structural reforms. Um, last but not least, I mean, if I have to, to make a conclusion more in the Triffin style, I would recommend always to think systemically. I mean, the problems that Triffin has uh, identified are essentially always systemic. And if, for instance, as you said, the savings of the Europeans do not go to the investments, this may be because there are flaws in the system. And that was also, indeed, the purpose of denouncing the, the, the Triffin uh, dilemma. And last but not least, of course, um, what you do so well in Europe, think about also its applicability in the other continents. I think that um, the links between Europe and Africa is absolutely essential. Fabio Mazzini, and you can see that on our website, has proposed the, the, the plan of EU-African solidarity based on the, on the transfer of the unused special drawing rights attributed to members of the European Union, which those members do not need. And that could be used as a collateral for major borrowing supporting development in Africa. We could also think about what we should do and help to do in Latin America, where they have only the embryo of um, uh, regional monetary uh, support system. And uh, we can also talk about the ASEAN, where they have the Chiang Mai initiative. So I think I have to stop here. But again, thank you very, very much uh, for um, allowing the Robert Triffin International Association to be associated with the important evening of tonight. Thank you very much.